Well, let's turn our hearts again to prayer before we look into this God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that these things are written. They are written in this book so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. May you work through this your word that all here would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and would have life now and life eternal in his name we pray. Amen. Now this morning as we think about the historical, physical, bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we proclaim this this morning, oftentimes both in the past and in the present, those who believe in the true resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ are often ridiculed. Many will reject this teaching. Both in the first century, it was that way, and it is today still in the 21st century. What we find is that in the first century, we look, and in many accounts in the book of Acts, as the apostles were preaching the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, what we find is that there were varied responses to this message. In Acts chapter 17, as Paul was there on Mars Hill in Athens in the Areopagus, as he was preaching to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and those in that day, it says in Acts 17 and verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And there are those who will mock today. When the apostles heard the testimony, the apostles themselves heard the testimony of the women who had encountered two angels as recorded in Luke 24, what was their response when they first heard of the resurrection of Christ? Well, in Luke 24, beginning in verse 5b, it says that the angel was now speaking to the women. It says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Now what was their response? It says, but... These words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Or we find in Acts chapter 4, others responded even more hostilely. We find, for instance, in Acts 4, as Peter is preaching of the resurrection of Christ, what does it say there, beginning at verse 1? It says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, and they were greatly annoyed. Why were they annoyed? Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so what did they do? It says, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. And so we have those, when they hear of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, they will mock. Others will think it is an idle tale. Others will get greatly annoyed and even respond hostilely, arresting those who would proclaim this message. We find even in Acts 7, as Stephen proclaimed that he saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, the people plugged their ears and took him out of the city and stoned him to death for proclaiming this message. So it was in the first century, and so we find it today in the 21st century. We think, well, we are men of science, we are men of empirical evidence and these kind of things and resurrections from the dead. These are fairy tales, these are myths, these are the kind of things that people believed when they were less sophisticated than us. There are many who would mock and ridicule those who would believe such a thing. 
We find, for instance, um, a man by the name of Yuval Noah Harari. He's a name you might want to remember. He's a very prominent man in the world today. He has great influence with many world leaders and those who are leaders in business and others. And he speaks at places like the World Economic Forum. You'll find him on many newscasts and other things. Well, what does this man think of Christ and the preaching of his resurrection? Well, he says this, all this story about Jesus rising from the dead and being the Son of God, this is fake news. This is fake news. This is a bunch of rubbish. Or we think of others like the well-known atheist Richard Dawkins. He says this, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the raising of Lazarus, and even the Old Testament miracles are all freely used for what purpose, he says, for religious propaganda. And they are very used very effectively with who? With an audience of unsophisticated people and children. Only unsophisticated people and children will believe this kind of religious propaganda. This kind of thing is just a bunch of rubbish. It is fake news. Others have said the accounts of Jesus' resurrection and ascension are about as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk. It is just a mere fairy tale. It has no substance, no facts, no history. It is just a myth. Now, while unbelievers and cynics may call the resurrection of Jesus Christ then an idle tale, they may mock it and such, call it propaganda and fake news. Ultimately, God and his providence, we find, although with such people might re remove them from the face of the earth in a moment if he chose, he could let the ground swallow them up, he could send fire from heaven and do these things to those who would mock such a great and glorious truth as the resurrection of Christ. The God in his providence and patience actually extends grace to unbelieving skeptics. Well, you might ask, well, how has he done this? Well, he's included one whom they can relate to in the scriptures. I am referring to the apostle who's come to be known as Doubting Thomas. We find his account in John 20 and verse 24 to 29, and we're going to look at it this morning. Here is a gracious gift to the skeptic, to the doubter, to the mocking unbeliever. This doubting Thomas is here in the scriptures in part for them and for us this morning. Now in verse 24, we encounter, first of all, absentee Thomas. Notice what it says. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. He was not with them when Jesus came. Well, what is that referring to? Well, this verse is hearkening back to the previous section in verse 19 and 20 of John chapter 20, where it says there in verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, this was Sunday, the first day after when Christ had risen from the dead, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so when that happened, on that day, Thomas was not with them. Now many have wondered why was it and speculated why Thomas wasn't with them. They say, oh, he was dejected and wasn't really happy, so he was off by himself and these kind of things. Well, I would commend to us that we would not speculate about the kind of things that the Holy Spirit has not deemed necessary to put into the scriptures. We don't need to so much need to know why Thomas wasn't there, but I am thankful that he was absent. I am thankful that in God's providence he wasn't there, that he didn't see the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ at the same time as the other apostles. Why would you say this? Well, there are many different theories and ideas and myths floating around today concerning the resurrection of Christ and how this sort of tale, many would say, came to be. And many of these things can be traced back right to the time when Christ had died. You remember that there were a number of guards who were at the tomb and the eyewitness accounts that as they fled from the tomb and they went and told the religious leaders what had happened, they got paid off to keep silent about the truth. And so they had to come up with some other plot, and the plot was this, that the apostles had come while the guards were asleep and had stolen the body of Jesus and now were, had plotted together to proclaim that he had resurrected from the dead. Now, what I find interesting here is that it is clear that obviously at least Thomas was not in on this plot. 
For notice how he responds when the others tell him about their encounter with the risen Christ in verse 25. Here we see Thomas the skeptic, the doubter. It says in verse 25, So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Why are you telling me this? We've already made this plot and I really don't need to hear about it. We said that we were going to pretend that he had risen. No, he says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Thomas here is given compelling eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Christ. And this is not merely the testimony of one individual, for we see that it begins the verse, so the other disciples in the plural. That is, the ten disciples, they are apostles, minus himself and Judas, who is no longer with them. It goes on to say, we have seen the Lord. In other words, it wasn't just one person in a back room somewhere, but these disciples, all of them, are bearing testimony to this. And the ones who are bearing testimony to him aren't just random strangers. For you and I, we might read a random stranger, and they start telling us about some kind of thing, and we think, that sounds a little odd. And we don't necessarily believe him. But yet if many of our friends and those whom we trust and family would come to us and say, this is what happened, we saw it with our own eyes, would we not believe them? And here what we find is it was his fellow apostles, these who had been his trusted friends for years that are telling him this. And it seems that they were insistent and persistent in telling him these things. For when it says that the disciples told him, the word told there is in the imperfect tense in the Greek, and thus it may imply that they kept telling him. And so they're pressing on him. We have seen him. We have seen Christ risen from the dead. And so what is Thomas's response? Well, in verse 25, it says, but, but he said to them, Unless I see, not, I don't, doesn't matter what you saw, I need to see it for myself. I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my fingers into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas is like the modern empiricist. Empiricism is a philosophical belief that states that your knowledge of the world is based on your experience particularly your sensory experience. According to the empiricists, our learning is based on our observations and perceptions that knowledge is not possible without experience. I need to experience this, Thomas. I need to see it. I need to touch him. Thomas insists not only that he would only see, but that he would touch and it's interesting that if you go back to verse 20, you'll find that the apostles, it says that Jesus showed himself to them. He showed them his hands and his side. It says nothing about touching. And so Thomas is kind of saying, well, it's one thing. You say you saw him. I need more than that. I need to personally experience this. I need not only to see him, but I want to touch him. I want to touch the nail marks. I want to place my hands in his side. In other words, I want to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the one who you say appeared was also the one who walked the earth and died on the cross and ultimately has nail marks to prove it. I want to stick my hand in his side. I don't just want to see. I want tactile evidence that this is the same person who is actually now alive and risen from the dead. And Thomas says, if these conditions are not met, I will never believe. And isn't that the way that so many of the skeptics, they say, well, you know, if I would just see this Jesus, he can come and meet with me and he can come show himself to me and do some miracles for me and these kind of things and then maybe I'll believe. And here is one of their kind right here in the New Testament. And when he says, I will never believe, it is a double negative there. In other words, I will never not ever believe. Or I definitely will not believe and I am thankful for Thomas. I am thankful that he was not easily convinced, not just taking it from others, but he wanted to see and touch himself. 
And he didn't just accept a vision, he wanted more than that. And it's interesting because there are many today that will, skeptics and others, that will say, well, yeah, we, we believe that the disciples had visions of Christ, that they had some kind of esoteric spiritual experience, some kind of maybe hallucination, if you will. We'll accept the fact that they had a vision of him. We find people like Marcus Borg, he's a, a false teacher and ultimately is, is greatly confused, has this to say about Christ and his resurrection and what happened there. He says, some of Jesus' followers, he will admit, experienced him after his death. As a figure of the present, not just of the past. And they experienced him as a divine reality, now one with God and at the right hand of God, in quotes, he says. Many of these experiences were visions. Another Paul's experience, he says, of the risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, described three times in Acts 9, 22, and 26, and referred to by Paul in Galatians in chapter 1, was clearly a vision. It happened a few years, three to five, after the death of Christ. Now what we find there is he did, in Acts 26, explain it and say it was a vision as such, but there was a real person, there was light, there was a voice, ultimately. But he says, okay, well, Paul had this vision, and so basically everybody else had visions too. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to his experience as belonging in a list of other visions of Jesus, to Peter, the Twelve, obviously not to Judas, to James, and 500 people at the same time. He says, visions are about seeing, as the word implies. Often visions involve seeing and hearing a person in bodily form and can even include tactility. What does he mean? A sense of touching or being embraced, but not a real one. Finally, he says, in addition to visions of Jesus, I think there were non-visionary experiences of the same presence and power that his followers had known in Jesus during his historical life. His followers continued to experience the same spirit, if you will, after his death. And so, well, people had visions of Jesus, that's one thing, but not touching him, seeing him, not a physical bodily resurrection of Christ, just sort of some kind of experience, if you will. But they will not believe that Jesus Christ actually physically and bodily rose from the dead, one who could be touched. And so they, like Thomas, when confronted with the many and varied eyewitness accounts of Scripture, of the physical bodily resurrection of Christ, come with their buts and their unlesses. They're willing to say, and they said, we are unwilling to believe that Jesus rose again from the dead unless unless our conditions are met, unless I would maybe see him in person, he could come and visit me, then I will believe. Give me some miracle. Give me some special experience. Let him appear to me. And so it's amazing that God in his grace has placed this account of Thomas in the Bible so that they and we can read of one who wasn't just an easily kind of early adopter of things. He wasn't easily duped by others. He was one who said, I want to see and touch. I want the evidence. And Jesus in his love reaches out to this doubting Thomas and through him reaches out to others who would not believe. Notice in verses 26 and 27, we see the grace of Jesus shown to Thomas. It says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And so Christ comes again in very similar language that was accounted in verse 19. It's as if he's coming again sort of in the very same way except now that Thomas is there and he has particular concern for Thomas. Jesus addresses him personally and graciously and we will see that, that in his response to Thomas he condescends graciously to him. Thomas has had four demands. He has four things that he says are conditions by which he must be convinced now, Jesus could have condemned Thomas for not believing his fellow apostles, for giving his conditions, 
But instead what Jesus does is the very conditions laid down in verse 25, he now gives corresponding commands that meet those four conditions in verse 27. So what we find is Thomas's words are thus. He says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, Jesus says to him, okay, see my hands. Thomas says, unless I place my finger into the mark of the nails, Jesus says, okay, put your finger here. Unless I place my hand in his side, Jesus says, put out your hand and place it in my side. Finally, Thomas says, I will never believe. And Jesus graciously says to him, do not disbelieve, but believe. Three observations here. Jesus reveals himself to be the omniscient one. He knows exactly what was in Thomas's heart and the words that came out of his mouth even though he wasn't there. And he meets his conditions exactly and precisely. Because he is God, he knows all things. And so he reveals his deity to Thomas as the one who is omniscient here. Also, secondly, Jesus invites Thomas to not just see, but to touch him. He realizes that this is important and he, said, and he does this because as Palmer says in his commentary, Christian faith does not worship a phantom Jesus, a fantasy Jesus, nor is it the brave faith of men and women about a memory of Jesus. Our faith is in the real, physical, bodily Jesus who lives today. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fundamental doctrine to the Christian faith. If Jesus did not rise physically and bodily from the grave, you and I are dead in our sins. Our faith is futile. My preaching is vain. And we have no hope of bodily resurrection at all. You can read Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15 this afternoon. It is clearly testified in Scripture over and over that Jesus Christ would not decay in the grave, but that he would bodily rise again from the dead. We find in Luke 24, if there's not enough evidence in other places, Luke 24 is a great example of this. It is very specific. It is very intentional about the language that is used there. If you want to turn there for a moment, Luke 24, beginning at verse 36. The Holy Spirit does not include these things in Scripture without reason. He knows that there will be doubting Thomases and there will be others who will question these things and he wanted to make sure that we understood them. And so in Luke 24 and verse 36, we find this account. It says, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and notice it says, they thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. He says, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Notice that Thomas was not the only doubting one. The others here, as we're given a more fuller account of what is included beforehand in John's gospel, ultimately also doubted. And yet Jesus comes to them in their doubts. They think they've seen a spirit. He says, no, touch me. I'm real. I'm a, this is a true body. It was a bit of a different body, a glorified body. Yes, there were certain things about it that were not quite the same. And yet it was a physical body, flesh and bone, he says. And ultimately, give me something to eat. I'll prove it to you. Spirits don't eat these things and ultimately digest them. Here it was a true, a physical, real, bodily resurrected Lord Jesus Christ who had appeared. Now there is no true faith, no true saving faith in an unresurrected, unbodily resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. That is another Jesus, the true Jesus that we believe in had a physical bodily resurrection. 
And Jesus' final command to Thomas at the end of that verse, ultimately, he gives not only to him, but he gives to all of us here, and he gives really to all the world, to all those like Thomas who would be unbelieving in their sin and ultimately would be cynics. He says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Now you might say, well, what does it look like when someone has come to believe? And I would say, well, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 28. Here is the confession of a true believer in this resurrected Christ. Notice that Thomas does not exclaim, my good teacher and my role model, I am glad you have returned. No, he says this, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in a physical bodily resurrection of Christ, nor do they believe that Jesus is Lord and God. But the true Christian believer believes that Christ is Lord, that he is master and we are his servants. This word Lord, kurios, is used in the Greek Septuagint over 6,000 times to translate the word Yahweh or Jehovah. In calling him Lord in this way, he is saying that he is divine and he says he is my Lord and my God. Jesus is was a man, yes. Jesus walked the earth, yes. He was tired. He was a real man, a true man, but he also was truly God. He was divine. He is the word that was made flesh and came to dwell among us that John began his gospel there and now we have this glorious confession that he is Lord and God. Now this confession of Thomas would be blasphemous if it was not true. And if it was not true, Jesus would have responded as Paul and Silas did in Acts in chapter 14 when the people thought that they were divine, even though false gods. They tore their clothes and they said, no, don't call us these things because God will not share his glory with another. And yet Jesus receives this from Thomas, this confession, because he is the divine second person of the Godhead. He is equal in glory and power with the Father. And this confession of Thomas was not brought forth because he had a kind of vivid spiritual encounter with a deceased loved one. I was reading this week, someone said, studies suggest that about half of surviving spouses will have at least one vivid experience of their deceased spouse. I don't know if that's true or not. But then they went on to say, but if they do, they do not exclaim when they see them, my Lord and my God, as if their spouse is now Lord and one with God. This is not just him kind of hoping that his good teacher had come back. Ultimately, no, this was the profession of one who had come face to face with the one whom the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 4. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. He was Lord and he was God because he had truly risen from the dead and then the Spirit confirms this ultimately and then Thomas declared it. And so if you remember last week how we saw and heard the confession of the Roman centurion at the death of Christ and how his confession that surely this dying one was the Son of God was really, if you will, the high point of Mark's gospel He professed that at the death of Christ. Now we have one here, near the end of John's gospel. It really is the high mark of John's gospel, this profession of Thomas, that not the dying Christ, but now the resurrected Christ, he proclaims to be his Lord and his God. For John is writing this gospel from beginning to end so that not only Thomas, but that all who would read it would come to confess as he had. For notice in verse 30 and 31 what it says. This is the purpose of the book. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is what the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All along, John has been writing that people would come to this place where they would recognize that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that they would believe and have life in his name. And here now is Thomas confessing that very thing. This confession of Thomas is both a universal confession and a personal one. 
He's, Jesus is not merely sort of a, a personal genie or a personal God, if you will. He, it is personal. We'll see that in a moment. But what Thomas is confessing is that not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is God, where Caesar in that day would call himself a son of the gods, claiming to div divinity and deity. Ultimately, he is saying here, no, Jesus alone is Lord and God. And Jesus Christ is not just Lord of my life. He is not just Lord of the church. Jesus Christ is Lord and God of the universe. He owns it all. He made it all. He is Lord of the nations. He is the one who is to have dominion from sea to shining sea. And those who come to confess this are only recognizing what is absolutely and factually true. They're not confessing something that's just a personal belief. It is a fact. It is the way it is. He is Lord and God over all the universe. Lord and God of you and I and every single person who has ever walked the face of the earth. Rich and poor, king and pauper, he is Lord and God of them all. It is a universal confession and it must be confessed by everyone. And because of this, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is to be worshipped, he is to be believed on, and he is to be obeyed. He is not just someone I can take and leave. That's why he said that his disciples were to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and to teach them to obey everything he commanded. He is your God. He is your Lord. Have you surrendered to him? Have you believed on him? Have you made this confession of the truth of who Christ is? For we see that this is not only a universal confession, but it is a very personal one. Thomas doesn't just confess a Lord and a God, but notice what he says. My Lord, my God. Jesus is the Lord, but he also must be acknowledged by the individual as one who is Lord and God. We must personally repent of our sin as Thomas here has done. He is repenting of his unbelief and now professing the truth. He has repented and he has believed in Christ personally. He is his Lord and his God. And this morning we are gathered here together and there are many in this room who profess Christ to be Lord and God, but what about you? Have you come to see this one who has been attested throughout the scriptures, who is the one who made the universe, who knit you together in your mother's womb as Lord and God of your life? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? to give you new life, to give you peace with God. And like Thomas, we're not just called to believe in some kind of idea or some kind of esoteric vision or a doctrine, but in a person, a person who lives today, a person who saves today, a person who will take anyone who has sinned against him by living in unbelief and living their life their own way. As Sinatra said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to believe these things. I don't want to have anything to do with Christ. I don't want to have anything to do with the church. And yet, if you would come to see who Christ is and believe on him and come to him, he is a living savior. He can save you today. He can transform your life. He can make you new. He can and reconcile you to God even now as we are here today now finally as we bring this to a close there may be some here today who would say well it's nice that you like the apostles are giving this witness to Christ but I'm more like Thomas and I'm going to kind of take the same road if Jesus will come and he'll appear to me if he's really alive and he will come and show himself to me so I can see him, so I can touch him, so ultimately I can have this experience. I'm an empiricist. I'm a scientist. I don't just believe based on someone else's testimony. Then I will believe. So I'm going to wait until he appears to me. What I will tell you this morning that you will wait in vain. He will not appear to you in this way. And you might say, well, then how am I supposed to come like Thomas to profess him as Lord and God? And my answer 
And John's answer, the Bible's answer, and therefore God's answer is twofold. One, you will come to believe and confess him by means of the word of God and through the help of the spirit of God. And there is no other way. You will come by the word of God because the spirit of God who inspired the word of God went to great lengths, great lengths to attest to the truth of Christ, his death, and his resurrection. And he didn't do this in vain, so as to leave any true seeker in doubt as to the truth. You find in a court of law, we're asked to have two or three witnesses, eyewitnesses ultimately. If you have two or three corroborating eyewitness accounts, ultimately then you can confirm that what is being attested to is true. And what we find in the Bible is we don't only have two or three witnesses, but we have four eyewitness testimonies in the Gospels, four corroborating testimonies of Christ, of his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection by those who were there, those who had seen and experienced these things. And in them is not only included one or two sort of obscure, if you will, testimonies to Christ appearing after he has risen from the dead. What we find is that there are various individuals and groups. We find someone like Mary Magdalene saw her, him, him herself. We find that some of the apostles then saw Christ. We find that Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were up to 500 at one time who witnessed his resurrected body and, and saw him. And not only that, he didn't just do it on one particular day, so everybody kind of was in a bit of a stupor and there was some kind of appearance that happened on one day to all these people at once. He did it over 40 days. 40 days, multiple appearances to multiple people, and then their testimonies have been written down. This is written testimony, eyewitness testimony, over and over and over again. And God has included them in his record So that people would come to see the written record of the the witnesses who testify to the truth of the resurrection of Christ. So that they would see Thomas's account and come to realize that the evidence was persuasive, that it was overwhelming. And God chose special people to see and to witness these things as eyewitnesses of the resurrection. He doesn't give this to everybody, but he gave them to particular people. And then he calls men and women to believe on their testimony that has been written in the word of God. Why do I say this? Well, a couple of examples. Acts 10 and verse 38. Peter is preaching in Cornelius' house there. And in his sermon in Acts 10 and verse 38, notice what he says. He's testifying to things that he has seen. He says there in verse 38 of Acts chapter 10, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, and then this, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us then to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him and receives forgiveness of sins will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of these things. We ate and drank with him, and God chose us specifically that we might testify to their truth. Will we believe their testimony given to us by the Holy Spirit in Scripture? For in John 17, 20, Jesus himself said this, as he, in his high priestly prayer, said it, I do not ask for these things only, for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus had prayed for his disciples and then he prays for those who would believe in him, not through experiences, not through seeing and touching him, but through their word. Or in the words that we'd already read in John chapter 20, verse 30, Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book 
But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so God, superintended by the Holy Spirit, that certain people would be chosen to see, to hear, to experience these appearings of Christ, risen from the dead, touching him, eating with him, etc. And then they would be carefully put down as the Holy Spirit oversaw them, ultimately in a book, so that we would read the book, read their testimony, and would come to believe. And so I want to say to you today, and you can tell your friends and family and others who might think you're a little off the wall by thinking that some man rose from the dead and we are now worshiping him today. As you speak about the resurrection, let them know that Jesus Christ will not be appearing to any of the doubters and skeptics today. But he does say to them, turn and read the book. Read the eyewitness testimony. If you will not believe after you've read the word of God and be convinced, you will not believe even if you, like Thomas, saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. We don't have time, but if you turn to Luke 16 sometime today, you'll recognize in the account of the rich man and Lazarus that, that ultimately the same thing is said there when he, the rich man who's now being tormented in hell, says to Abraham, Please, can you send Lazarus back from the dead to tell my brothers so that they won't end up in this place like I am? That they might believe seeing Lazarus risen from the dead. And he says, well, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible. They have the word of God. If they will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe if someone rises from the dead. So we have the book. Read the book. Today, go home if you are not a believer in Christ and start at the beginning of John's gospel and pray that you would come to see and believe in this Christ. Now someone might say, well, I want to believe. How am I to come to believe? I just can't believe these things. And ultimately, what I might say is that we need help to understand these things. It is not Merely through the word of God, although it begins there, we have another helper, another teacher. Ultimately, the human condition is such that men and women, through unaided reason, apart from the powerful work of the Holy Spirit of God, will never come to believe and surrender their lives to the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. You might say, well, I've heard these things a lot, but I just don't believe them. Well, you need help. Because ultimately the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And you need one more powerful than him to open your mind to the truth. We are spiritually blind and need the Spirit of God to remove the blinders, to give true saving faith, to do a regenerating work in our hearts so that we might come to love, to trust in, to put our faith in, to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, when speaking of what happened to the Corinthians when they heard this message, said it this way. He said, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. This is what you need. If you want to know Christ, pray that the Holy Spirit of God would open your eyes in power and give you conviction of the truth. You might say, I wish I could believe. Well, you then, like the one in Jesus' day when he spoke to him, he said, I believe, help my unbelief. God, help me to believe this because you're not only your life today, but your eternal life depends on this. You need to have everlasting life and the only place it comes from is through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Read John's Gospel. Pray that the Spirit of God would open your eyes. Pray that he would open your eyes right now that you might come to believe on his Son and so be saved. For I declare to you this morning as we conclude that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and well. He has risen from the dead. He has ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God whether you believe it or not. He is there and even upholds the universe by the word of his power. He ultimately gives you life and breath and everything else that you might worship him, that you might serve him, that you might proclaim to all the world that the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is Lord, God, Savior, and King. This is why we were made to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. 
And he, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, calls everyone here today and everyone throughout the earth to repent and believe on him. For he will come one day, the real Lord Jesus Christ, to judge the world in righteousness. And you will meet him one day and you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will bow the knee to him. Will you surrender to him today and be saved or will you surrender to him and ultimately to his judgment one day when he returns one day on the clouds in glory? Jesus Christ has promised this in Romans 10, 9. He says, if you confess with your mouth in his word that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord as Thomas did and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. At that moment in time, it says, the vilest offender, said the hymn writer, who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. You may have been living your life in rebellion against your Lord and your God, but today he says, come to me. Come and see the testimony of Thomas. I had real hands that were pierced because of your sin. I died on that wretched cross bearing the sins of man, propitiating the wrath of God so that you could be reconciled and have peace with God even today. I bore this on your behalf and I've risen again from the dead. I've been delivered up for your trespasses and raised for your justification. Believe on me. The triumphant, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, as he rose again from the dead, gives full assurance to all that our atonement was accomplished. Our ransom has been paid, the justice of God has been satisfied, and all who have put their faith in him will be justified, not condemned before the throne of God, but welcomed into eternal glory. Oh, that this morning, that there would not be a single one here who would not have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed with Thomas and could heartily declare this morning that Jesus is their Lord and their God. Can you confess this? I pray that you would. The Holy Spirit helping you through the word of God today. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for so many eyewitness testimonies to the truth of who Jesus was and what he came to do. And we thank you, O Lord, that you have given the Spirit of God to open blind eyes and to change hearts and minds. We pray that he would work in all of us today, that he would strengthen the faith of those who are believing already, and that he would open the eyes and Reveal Jesus Christ to those who have not yet confessed him as Lord and God. And Lord, may you help us as we go out into another week among so many who have not yielded to Christ but have rebelled against him. Live in hostility toward him. May we proclaim him. And may your spirit enable us to do this faithfully. And may he work in the hearts and lives of those who have not come to know him. And may he bring many sons to glory through our witness, as he did throughout the book of Acts, through the witness of the apostles. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are risen and that you continue to take those who are dead in their sin and bring them to newness of life through the work of your word and your Holy Spirit. Do it amongst us and amongst those we love. And we thank you for this, your word, this morning. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen.